The trouble is, coming on at the end of the day, is that um, your presentation then gets 15 yards longer than it was when you first came in, because in actual fact what you want to do is to comment on everybody else's presentation. So I will desperately try and keep this to time, um, but, but there are some other things I've added in just in terms of some of the discussions that, that have happened over, over the period we've been here today. Um, so I've been asked to, to speak about cyber security in the age of, of artificial intelligence. Um, I've been in the IT industry for 41 years, at which point you're meant to say, goodness me, Ian, that's not possible, you look far too young. No, nope. okay, fair enough. Um, and, and I originally started in the area of artificial intelligence. Uh, I much preferred at that point to, to talk about augmented intelligence uh, because I believe that what we were trying to do there was to augment uh, the individual professionals to, to help them make better decisions. I still believe that, but I'm not very good at marketing. Um, there's some brilliant um, handouts at the back of the room about the retro computer stuff they've, they've got here. Um, I was also part of the project team to build the first ever UK NETOP. So, you know, so please don't take any marketing advice from me whatsoever. But the AI element, I believe, is really important, and I think it will become an increasingly important thing in different areas of the um, information assurance marketplace. I apologise for describing what we do, but it fits in terms of where we're going in terms of the rest of the presentation. We're a not-for-profit organisation. We have four main pillars of our activities. We are credit organisations in cybersecurity incident response, penetration testing, cybersecurity related uh, threat intelligence, and, uh, and we also are just about to launch a SOC accreditation, so Secure Operation Centre accreditation process. Uh, we also provide professional level qualifications, so again referring back to the previous presentation, what we're trying to do is to look at the professionalisation of the industry, looking back at the ISSP presentation, this concept of, of continual training, development and some form of certification for professionals is very important to us. Um, our examinations kick in at around about 1800 hours after a good master's degree, uh, but you can come with any level of experience and if you've done an awful lot of work in this particular area beforehand and you think you're good enough, you can actually try and sit any of our exams. The next one up is about 6,000 hours, then 10,000 hours, then we have some specialist areas, uh, and then we repeat uh, those examinations every three years. So we don't look at the concept particularly of professional development. Uh, we are looking at mastery learning at the moment, uh, but most of the time, because we're evolving so quickly in the industries in which we operate, in actual fact, what I'm doing is, is making sure that we keep our examinations up to date, then reassessing people. We tie those two elements together um, through what we would describe as schemes, and I'll, and I'll describe some of those schemes because, again, it fits with some of the, the concepts of AI. Um, but we also tie them together with enforceable codes of conduct. So if we remove uh, an organisation from our register, uh, that means they won't do work for the Bank of England or the Financial Services Authority or, or some of the other regulatory bodies within the UK financial services. I have an agreement with the telecommunications uh, industry as well, so they won't do work for, uh, for the telecoms. Um, I have a back-to-back -back agreement with GCHQ, so they won't do the check work under the NCSC programme. I represent the, NCS, the NSA in the United States, so if it's incident response, I will remove them from that register as well. They won't work for organisations like the Hong Kong Monetary Authority, Singaporean Monetary Authority, Bank Nagari in Malaysia. So all of a sudden, that removal is actually quite a significant impact in terms of the organisation. And we can do exactly the same for an individual, and we have defined processes for doing it. In actual fact, we struck our first person off a little while ago, after 10 years. Um, if you then look at the other areas, we do knowledge sharing, professional development is really making sure that we are sharing information. So everything we do is public domain, free to consume and free to use. Uh, you can take all of the material we do, rebadge it, reconstitute in any form, I'm not going to shout at you. Um, but what we're trying to do there is to develop a whole range of different things. For example, we run a conference, but our conference has 600 people come to it, we run it jointly with the ISSP, um, but we have 40,000 downloads so far of, of the content that we record and make available for free. There's something called Crest Advocate, which has got similar numbers, and I'll describe some of the other areas. We also do research in terms of looking at things like how the utilisation of AI will move forward and the effects that will have in terms of the profession, and we tie that together with professional development activities to help people move through their career pathways. We don't provide training. We believe that's a slight conflict of interest between a true certification body that only issues certificates and does examinations, and therefore we work very closely with academia and the training providers to make sure that they're providing the right tools but actually delivering a service. If you then look at that, 
in terms of our industry support guides, what we're doing is we're producing things like procurement guides. So if you want to buy penetration testing services or intelligence-led penetration testing or cyber security related incident response, there's procurement guides. We produce free to use maturity models. And again, you can then benchmark yourself against the industry. You can set your maturity model that you're trying to reach and then you can actually do some evaluation against that. And then we also do some other things looking at specific areas. This one's on network security monitoring and logging. And we've just launched one on industrial control systems information assurance. Uh, there's quite a lot of information in there. Um, we'll give it to you on paper if you want it, or you can download it for free from our website. All this material is free. There was quite a lot of talk about support for careers. Um, we do quite a lot of that, as, as the ISSP said earlier on. Um, so there's a few things that we've done. Uh, there's a careers guide there for university age students. Um, we say university age students because it can be that you're going through a level four apprenticeship or a level six when they start to come on board. They're not there yet. Um, but um, what we're trying to do there is provide advice and guidance about where you might go to get a career in this space, the sorts of things you might look at, the sorts of people you might follow, and the sort of approach you should take in terms of approaching and selling yourself to the market. We have a similar one for uh, school level people, about 14 to 16 year olds. And again, for example, the National Crime Agency of in the last two months have distributed 9,000 copies of that uh, of gaming conventions and other, other areas they've, they've gone into to look at their intervention programs. And then we have something called inspiredcareers.org. If you're interested in a career in this space, please have a look. We've got 250 day in the life videos. We define around, around about 70 roles. And we look at the types of qualifications, the type of certificates you should have to move into certain disciplines. And it also describes and gives you some empathy in terms of the types of organisations that work in that space. Uh, we would really like to develop that further. We're just about to develop a telecoms building. And, and we're working with a tech partnership looking at other areas of IT as well. So, and then we're also providing a school where we can link in subjects like English, we can link in things like PPE or history into those areas uh, so we can drag that information through to make it available for people to give them the career options that are available in what I think is a fantastic industry in which to work. Um, there was a little bit of talk about schools and, and I stuck another bit in. Um, this is another part of my life. Um, so, so the only reason I put that in here is because we're just about to run in new key in two weeks time, week and a half now. Um, so if you want to see the fastest car in the world running new key, about 200 miles an hour, um, then we're aiming for a thousand miles an hour car. But what we're actually doing is trying to inspire a whole new generation to think about science, technology, engineering and maths. And I think at the school level, they should be aware that there is a potential career option uh, in the cybersecurity space. But what we need to do first is to encourage them into the particular subjects in which we're weak on in terms of available um, information and people in those particular domains. And what I've tried to do is to rip the tea out of that in terms of technology and make sure that we're actually doing some of the things to support people that are looking for a technology-based um, career. Um, we also have some social responsibility reports. Um, I'll come back to the one on the far right hand side. I did say that I would never ever produce a, a report from Crest that had somebody wearing a hoodie, um, somebody had matrix numbers dropping down the side of the screen, and we'd never ever have it in dark blue. Right? So, so I've sort of cut through all of that uh, because I think it's actually a relevant picture. Uh, but that's um, an NCA report we did two years ago with the National Crime Agency looking at intervention points to stop young people being groomed into cybercrime. And we've been working with them in terms of their strategy for the last two years to put in those intervention points, which are both technical intervention points and also social intervention points to stop that grooming happening and try to put it into a more structured position. Um, we also have a report on closing the gender gap, and that's pulling together a number of the other um, um, groups that are looking at this particular area. So, for example, it was mentioned earlier, the KPMG work that's being done in this area, uh, they were contributors to this report. So we're very much a collaborative organisation. We pull together this material to make it available to everybody. Um, it was mentioned about autism. Uh, we work with IAC on the autism reports as well. So IAC looked at it from a supplier's perspective, uh, sorry, an employer's perspective, and we looked at it from the support to the individuals who have an autistic trait. Um, in our industry, um, we have people on the spectrum, uh, either diagnosed or not diagnosed. Um, we are used to working with that type of people, very convergent people. Um, 
there are lots of jokes about pen testers and particularly about intrusion analysts, people and malware reverse engineers. So, um, but what we're trying to do there is to make sure that those individuals are prepared for the world of work, make sure they've got the support structures in place, that they not only get a job but they actually stay in a job. And what we're trying to do is to break some of the perception links between cybercrime and people with autism as well. We're working with the National Autism Society quite a lot. I do work at Slinton College, for example, some of the specialist autism areas, and it's a really interesting domain in which, in which we're doing work. Um, some of the other ones, we're just about to launch a SOC accreditation, international, really interesting. Anybody who's looking at developing or working within a SOC should be looking at that. We've done some work writing reports on the charter status, which again was described earlier. Uh, bug bounty, we've been doing an international research project looking at bug bounty and how the supply community should react to it and how the potential buyers should react to it and how young people or other people that are on bug bounty programs, whether or not they should and what they should be expecting to get out of it. Um, Bug Crowd, for example, has got 100,000 people registered, even if that's a small percentage in the number of people that are actually active doing this work, um, it's a significant number and they're looking to grow that to half a million within 18 months. Now, is that a legitimate thing? Should we be concerned about it? Should we embrace it? What should we do? What type of contract should there be? How do you close down a bug bounty program? What do you do if you don't fix the results? There's a whole pile of things that we need to consider and we need to look at that in terms of what we're doing. Um, we're looking at penetration tests, sorry, wider diversity. We live, we're doing some work with dyslexia, penetration testing standards, and we're also looking at social engineering for pen testing. I mentioned schemes earlier, and, and all of that stuff sort of fits into what we're doing in this particular area here. And a scheme, by our definition, is the combination of a accredited company and certified individuals. We, we use our terminology very careful. We have just approaching 100 accredited companies on a global basis. Um, and it's a really hard bar for organisations to get over. In addition to that, to run a scheme, you then have to have suitably qualified individuals. We do recognise other people's qualifications, uh, but all we do have our own set. But what we're doing here is looking at penetration testing. We're looking at things like CBEST, which was critical national infrastructure financial services. So far, our organisations have looked at 36 of the top 38 systemic risk areas within the UK financial services. This isn't losing a little bit of financial information or personal data. This is losing the interoperability of the banking system in the City of London. Significant stuff. And we're trying to make sure that we understand how to accredit or at least how to assess the, the capability in those areas. We've just launched something called TBEST, which is telecommunications. Uh, we're also working with people like the civil nuclear, uh, the rail distri distribution people, aviation and space. We're trying to build up a whole portfolio of looking at those critical national infrastructures, working with the regulators in those areas. We work, as I mentioned before, with the NSA, um, looking at their incident response, and we also work with the UK government under the CSIR and CIR schemes. And we work with the CHECK scheme, which is the government's health check penetration testing area, where we supply about 90% of the people that run under the CHECK scheme. And then we've got another couple of areas, including Cyber Essentials, which was mentioned earlier, uh, where we're the architects of Cyber Essentials, but I don't necessarily like the way the UK government has implemented it, and I don't think necessarily we've learnt the lessons in terms of the way it was approached. I'll come on to that as well. But really, from a technology perspective and from a security perspective, we're looking at these areas. We're looking at reducing threat, reducing vulnerability, avoidance, which really is an option very often now. It, are we not going to go into e-commerce? Really? Are we not going to do these types of deliveries? Really? Are we not going to run a CRM which has got a massive amount of personal data on? Really? We, it's very difficult to avoid those sorts of things now, so I won't concentrate on that one too much. Uh, detection and recovery, and tying those together with some of the new technology areas that would move into it. So the first thing to consider is that reducing the threat is really difficult. That's been mentioned. We haven't really got the support of the legal environment, so we haven't really got the support of the regulators. If things go wrong, they tend to hit the organisations, not necessarily hit the people that are attacking them. It's a very strange position we're taking in terms of trying to reduce the threat by beating up the people that are being attacked rather than actually trying to go after the people that are making the attacks. Very strange, untypical in terms of what we would normally do for law enforcement. But that reduction of threat is very difficult. And that's one of the reasons why we've been working with the National Crime Agency. On one piece of software, they sent out 6,000 cease and desist notices, all to young men. There was not one woman in that group, um, suggesting that they download explicitly illegal software, and the NCA were looking at them. That the, the 
the dark web part and some of the social media went absolutely ballistic because nobody believed it was actually the NCA that was writing those reports. And, and they did somewhere in the region of about 200 site visits. And so we collated that information. And now what we're trying to do, as I've mentioned before, is build inter, inter, um, interjections in that, in that life cycle of somebody being groomed into cybercrime to try, try to provide positive interventions and positive activities that these young people can do. Generally, they are young people. So that's really about all we can do. But if you look at that in terms of threat reduction, then I think artificial intelligence can be used to combine a huge amount of threat intelligence information. And we can, for the first time, try to use that collaboration or consolidation of information and use big data analytics and artificial intelligence uh, to actually look at that from an anal analytical perspective and then try to draw inference from it so we can actually start to do things that would mitigate some of the attacks that might come through. I think we should be looking at that threat information from a geopolitical perspective, a big data analytics perspective. We should be doing some dark, um, dark web analysis. It's very difficult, some of that, because it's generally filled with consultants and journalists. Um, and anybody who's really on the dark web is not on the dark web that most people can access. Uh, but by the same token, we should be monitoring those things. We should be monitoring our social media. And we should be looking in terms of specific company targeted or specific sectorial based changes in the threat. And this use of artificial intelligence and big data analytics for the first time ever will allow us to actually start to do that from a consideration of a threat perspective. So that building those artificial intelligence based systems in the threat intelligence industry is a really good thing. I'm not saying they've got it absolutely right. I'm not saying that every company is providing a good thing. When I go to RSA in the States, some of the companies that say they do this type of threat intelligence really don't. Uh, they've got basically some monitoring software on the back end of their SOC and they're calling it some form of threat intel. That's not what we're talking about. But what we're trying to do here is to grow an industry that's actually going to be a reactive to the types of threats we're seeing coming from the future. You then move up to the next part, which is penetration testing. And we're looking at that, at trying to do the implementation of standards to reduce vulnerabilities. So that reduction of vulnerabilities is generally what I've done for most of my life. We've identified vulnerabilities, and then we've tried to do something about it. That vulnerability could be in your HR system. It could be in your awareness programs. It could be in your technical environment. But generally, we're trying to find weaknesses, and then we're making security-based recommendations to improve the current position. But penetration testing is absolutely one of those areas, and it should be tied into that. But what we need to do is to tie that in with the implementation of the more general standards, 27001, all of those sorts of things. There was a statement about 27001 earlier in terms of it, how applicable it is for a small organisation. Um, I was one of the first four organisations to be accredited against the standard. At that time, I employed 40 people. It is really is appropriate, you just have to manipulate it, and in some ways it's easier for a small organisation to consolidate its policies, process and procedures than it is for large ones. But what we need to do is, if we're going to do penetration testing, we need to build that into our security improvement plan. I don't take my car and I don't tell people I've gone for an MOT test, I tell people I, my car has passed that test. It's a real strange use of terminology, but it's much better than hacking. But at that point, we need to think about what level of penetration testing or vulnerability assessment or threat intelligence-led penetration testing or red teaming, what is it we need to do at the different parts of our organisation? This diagram here starts to describe some of those things. So right at the bottom ele element, we can do some VA. We can do some vulnerability assessment. It's a requirement under some of the implementations of Cyber Essentials. It's also a requirement under PCI, the Payment Card Institute. Um, and that's a real basic level. So if all you've got is really basic information that's being processed, um, then you'll probably get away with that in terms of that level of, of, of testing. But then when you start to come up, you then move into de defined scope penetration testing. So in other words, we're testing a particular service or product. Then objectives, so you're looking at a service rather than an individual products. And then you start moving into the more generic areas where we're looking at proper critical national infrastructure or, or major assets for the organisations where we've got to provide additional levels of assurance, both technical and non-technical. Obviously, I'm more interested in the technical areas, but what we need to do is to bite tie those things together. So what you need to do is to have some view of the criticality of your information and your systems. You should be using artificial intelligence to help you in terms of the threat intelligence to understand whether or not you're perceived to be a target. 
I did quite a lot of work, as I mentioned, in the civil nuclear industry. They couldn't understand why they would be targeted. I was, I was amazed. Ransomware, at the very least, but they, they couldn't see why anybody would want to attack them. I do quite a lot of work with the charities, and I was standing next to somebody on the stage in the US a little while ago, which was a children's charity, had been ransomware for almost 70% of their turnover for a whole year. Uh, quite incredible. But what we need to do is to understand what level of assurance you should actually be doing at those sorts of levels to make sure at critical national infrastructure we're doing the right things and we're protecting ourselves against hostile intelligence services and at the bottom we're protecting ourselves against generic ransomware type attacks and, and encryption. Um, in terms of AI and vulnerability assessment, it's very difficult to support the lower end of the market. Uh, because there's a lack of resource and cost. So if I was trying to sell you a penetration test, I don't sell penetration tests, um, but it'd be very difficult if you were an SME to, for me to provide that type of information and, and that type of service. Because as, as has rightly been said, there's not enough people, we're quite expensive, and, and generally you'd be, you'd be your cost of sale for doing this at a small enterprise level would be um, in proportionate with, against the, the cost of actually doing the work. So it's very difficult to do that, and attack tools are more, so put the more automated and sophisticated, and therefore the analysis tools need to keep pace. Really what I'm saying there is, if I was a cyber criminal, um, then, then what would I do? If I was a business person, I think is more important, what would I do? I've got a product set, and I believe that product set is coming to its end of life. At that point, I would be flooding the market with that product, and I'd be maximising the amount of investment and money I got at that latter part of the stage of that product life cycle to make sure I've generated enough cash for my next level of investment for my next round of, of products and services. If I was trying to be clever, I would probably use that to cloud what I was doing to, to make it more applicable to where I'm going into, in terms of the market. That's exactly what I'd do if I was a cyber criminal. What would I be investing in now? I'll be investing in marketing activities, big data analytics, and the use of artificial intelligence to make people open emails. The concept, I think, in the future of mass phishing attacks will become mass whaling attacks. So in other words, there'll be very sophisticated, targeted attacks at individuals using automated tools. And therefore, what we've got to do is to build those sorts of tools back to defend ourselves, but we should be doing it now. And I don't actually think we're taking this seriously enough in terms of the next wave and the next generation of attack tools that are coming through, because I think we are flooded by generic-type, productized ransomware that you can buy off the, off the dark web with a four-star rating and some guarantee of return, and, and YouTube videos to tell you how to extract the money through Bitcoin. Um, we also need to assess the outcome-based results of these tools, and that needs to be done in exactly the same approach as, as other people. What we're doing at the moment is we're getting a lot of information in a lot of different areas, and we're not necessarily using technology to help us to analyse that information, draw inference, and then take action. Particularly take action. I've mentioned Cyber Essentials. I know it's been mentioned a couple of times, so I'll flick through that, but there's five generic areas that, that we look at. The secure configuration, um, boundary and firewall protection, access control, patch management, and malware protection. It's not very sophisticated. It doesn't look broader. It was designed for the SME market and is now being used for major defense contractors. Really difficult. How can you do a whole IP address range um, evaluation of even a university, let alone an international business? Um, so, so there is some difficulties with it in terms of how it's been applied, but the generic side of it I'm, I'm more than comfortable with in terms of the standards, and what you should be doing is at the very least looking at these sorts of things. I do a lot of presentations for local authorities, and I make no apologies for the language I use. If people don't understand the language, they've really got to go away and look at it and find out what that language is saying and what we're actually meaning in the industry. There's different ways of doing the assessment. Um, basically, under the CREST implementation, there's more than one implementation, which I think is confusing. Under the CREST implementation, even at Cyber Essentials level, you'd have to do a basic internal vulnerability scan. Um, and then Cyber Essentials Plus, which sounds like a bit of an add-on, but in actual fact, that's what all of the organisations here should be, at the minimum be aiming for. Then what we're doing is we're adding in some of the benchmarking elements associated with the, with the back office systems and some of your normal configurations. It's all right. It's a good start, it's not quite fit for purpose, 
but, but it is the best. And in actual fact, if you look around the rest of the world, it's much better than this massive framework or their 10 steps. It's much better than the stuff that's coming out of ANISA. It's much better than the stuff that's coming out of the Middle East and much better than Southeast Asia. We are ahead of the game. We as the UK, in terms of having the ability to export, should be looking at this and thinking about our export market. But what I think I'm saying is, if you look at those controls, and you look at the awareness programs, what they're doing is trying to protect ourselves against the current threats that we're seeing. Don't be stupid and open this email. Don't believe your Nigerian cousin is going to walk in with a wheelbarrow full of money and give it to you. Right? Those sorts of naive and stupid type questions, I think, is, is absolutely legitimate. We shouldn't be doing that, and I think a lot of people are now aware of that, um, but even if they don't act. So, so they are aware, we need to change that. I think cultural change program is a term I much prefer in terms of awareness. I really like some of the other stuff you were describing. But my problem with it is we've got to evolve to meet the new generation of attack tools. On a Friday afternoon, I get an email from my wife saying, open this urgently because we're going out at seven o'clock and you need to open this attachment because it tells you where it is you're meant to be and why aren't you there, I will open it. I, I know where my big threats are coming from, Absolutely my wife, right? That's the most scary part of my life, right? So I will open that. And what we're now seeing is that concept of, of attack generation that is very targeted to the individual or organisation and it's going to be really hard to detect. And we've got really good marketing organisations that are making us open things in Facebook and Instagram and other social media that we're now getting used to clicking on those links. And what they're going to do is start to push that sort of stuff down. That is what I would do if I was a cyber criminal. And I can assure you they're a lot brighter than me. And certainly they've got more money to invest in this type of product and service. They are a business, absolutely a four-star business that has a rating and a guarantee. They are operating these things as business. Even if they're utilizing young people, they're grooming young people into bad behavior and do, into doing illegal things, at the top level, they're operating as a business. And this is a lot easier than drugs. And to be quite honest, at the moment, it's more lucrative. We are actually looking at trying to protect ourselves against new generations of attack tools and threats, and we need to change the model. Uh, the way I describe it is that my wife works in a charity shop. Um, she gets an awful lot of theft, huge amount of theft out of a charity shop. If she then steps up from that, then the cameras and the tags and all that sort of thing is what you generally see on the high street to stop people walking out. That's not going to uh, protect you against a, a mass attack where people rush in, steal stuff and run away. Uh, because they don't care about whether or not the alarms go off because they're just stealing them stuff and walking away. And therefore, a lot of the high street chains have moved into controlled environments within the shopping centres. Really, what they're trying to do at that point is protect themselves against a more consolidated attack. What we're seeing now is small retail businesses and small businesses trying to protect themselves against the mafia. And I can't see how that's going to work for the future unless we start looking at the analytical tools and we start using AI and big data analytics to help those small organisations, or we start accrediting cloud services and putting more trust in them so we can actually implement it in an effective way. We then look at the more formal link with the existing standards. And I think this comes up to the next level where what we're actually saying is if you've got assets that you want to protect, you should be testing to make sure that they are fit for purpose and they are appropriately protected. The controls you put in place are operating, your firewalls are in the right place, your network monitoring and logging is picking stuff up, uh, you've got the correct um, uh, procedures associated with the allocation of accounts, all of that stuff that we generally look at in terms of traditional pen testing. Your apps are secure, you know, you've configure them correctly, etc. But what we really need to do as organisations is to take the output of that and put it into our security improvement plan. What we're seeing at the moment is people going to CEO type dinners and presentations and lunches saying, I've had a penetration testing done. I've had my car tested. That doesn't mean to say it's safe. But at the moment, we don't have any metrics to actually measure above cyber essentials about what good looks like. Um, I've got a US uh, exec member who is the architect of the um, penetration testing standard. Um, he admits he didn't quite get it right. What we're trying to do as an industry is try and improve that, but we're also trying to use proper techniques to allow that to happen, and we're also trying to augment the expertise of the individuals working at this level with the use of automated tools, and the automation is really linked to artificial intelligence, big data analytics, and understanding the threat landscape.
We must tie these things together, otherwise we're wasting our time, and, and the industry itself will get really upset, because you do a pen test, come back the next year and find the same stuff. That's easy money. Generally, as I would agree with the previous presentation, um, people don't always come into this industry for the money. They actually come in there because they've got a social conscience, which I'll come on to in a little while. Therefore, we need to establish minimum standards that are not pre too prescriptive and can evolve quickly. And, and Crest is doing some work on an international basis to try and look at what that means. In other words, who signs off the reports, who signs off the scope, who makes sure that things are done appropriately, and who signs off from the internal that it's gone into a, some form of security improvement plan, and there is some interpretation of results. That's the minimum that we can do. We've been asked by the buying community to receive penetration testing reports and review them. I really don't want to do that. Um, lots of issues with that. Um, but you can see the nervousness in terms of the way that people are operating in this space. But we need to make sure that we establish those minimum standards. We need to do that quickly. And you as the buying community or the new people coming into the industry itself need to adopt those standards and understand why they're important. The really exciting thing about this industry is we set our own rules. We are really in a position where, where anybody can make a big difference if they work hard enough, they think about the subject enough, and they put forward recommendations. I, I'm joyous in terms of the, the amount of input I get from people that think slightly outside the box and bring slightly different approaches. You then come up to the top of the stack, critical national infrastructure. Widely overused term. Uh, there's a whole pile of critical national infrastructure areas within the UK government. It's roughly consistent with what we've got in other areas of critical national infrastructure on a global basis. But there is big concerns in this area about the protection of, of these types of assets. Uh, and that's from state-sponsored attack, very serious organised crime, and other people that might want to do harm on, on a nation-state perspective or big ransomware or other reasons for doing it if you can generate some cash. But the difference here is the people that are likely to be mounting attacks are well resourced, well uh, managed, um, they understand the marketplace and they're supported. Right? So it's a very different thing from buying a piece of ransomware and running it against a charity. We are talking about consolidated attacks here on a, on a consistent basis over a long period of time extremely different in terms of what we're actually doing in terms of our level of protection. So we were asked to, to look at this and try and work out what we would do differently from a critical national infrastructure. The risk to knocking something over is quite significant, so therefore we put additional project management, additional technical controls and additional um, break points um, and, and we have a lot more dialogue to say we could go further but we're not going to because it's a bit dodgy. Um, but if you look at the way we traditionally do pen testers, pen testing, you've got the skill and knowledge and competence of the individuals, you've got their tools, and then you've got some validation from their peers. We do share quite a lot of information within our industry, formally and informally. You've then got OWASP. OWASP isn't a qualification, just to correct the previous presentation. Um, and we've got other public sources of threat information we can start to drag through. You've then got individual company research, and then you've got pub published cyber threat intelligence, as well as some other stuff you might, you might gather. But what we try to add in is another two elements. We, we wanted to add in the up-to-date threat intelligence to give us context, and also to understand the real threat scenarios that you're likely to be um, facing if you're running these types of services, either critical functions within your business or critical parts of the national infrastructure. That we've done. I think we've done it OK. I think we're learning lessons all the time. It's an evolving new area, fabulous place. If you look again at the career pathways, um, the last of the last six young people I've placed, uh, I've placed two from PPE, one from international politics and one from politics. They've all gone into threat intel. Um, really interesting, the big analytical stuff, taking big concepts, bringing them down, looking at the use of technology and tools, all the stuff we'd expect to see coming out of those sorts of individuals. What I've failed to do so far is to drag down the internet information. I wanted to pull that from the certs and some of the information exchanges. I don't currently do that, um, and I believe that we should. We've pulled that together to, to look at the emerging threat intelligence industry. As I say, you can criticise it a bit. Um, I actually think it's absolutely magnificent. The first time ever in 40 years, I haven't been talking about reduction of vulnerability, I've been talking about the reduction of threat, or at least an understanding of what the threat might be, and therefore we can do something about it. That emerging threat intelligence industry is fabulous for what we're actually trying to do, and at the moment I don't think we've embraced it in quite the way that we might. 
But what we're trying to do in this context of, of top-level critical national infrastructure review is to do evidence-based contextualised testing, red teaming on heat. The other difference is that generally if you do a penetration test over 10 days, it takes you 10 days. It might take you 11 or 12, but, but a limited period of time. Whereas we're seeing these types of services being run over three or four months with the same sort of a number of days going into it, um, but it much more mirrors what's happening in terms of the types of attacks where you move in very quietly and you gradually escalate in terms of your access to critical um, assets. So, so it's much more simulation in terms of what that looks like. Um, we have two that we've implemented in the UK, as I mentioned, CBEST, um, that is all of the critical national infrastructure for the financial services. Um, they are now looking at dropping from the top 38 to the next 250, then underneath that 2,000, and then you've got something like 40,000 um, uh, financial services businesses operating in the UK. And what we're trying to do is to stack that so we understand exactly what we're doing. CBEST has been running for three years. We're now going into our second round of, of reviews. And then we've seen that being adopted by the Hong Kong Monetary Authority. Uh, we've seen it being adopted by the Singaporean Monetary Authority. Bank Nagari in Malaysia want to adopt it. I'm dealing with the Canadian regulators right now, people from Indo Indonesia. Um, I'm also looking at that from a perspective of what we're going to do from the European Commission perspective. There's something called Tiber that runs in Holland, which is utilising the same types of services. But we're also working with the European Central Bank to look at the other 23 member states. And, and there will be a financial services standard-ish that will come out of that that will be regula regulatory driven. We're working with telecommunications in both Ofcom and DCMS, um, and we've just started to roll out the T-Best program. And then we're working in other areas of the critical national infrastructure. So the concept is C-Best at the top, T-Best here. Uh, there's something called G-Best. I really would have liked it to have been Check Plus, but that, that anybody who understands that terminology would understand what I'm saying. Um, I'm starting to deal with rail and aviation in transport. I'm starting to deal with space because space supports telecoms, transportation supports everybody else. And if we haven't got power, we're a bit buggered. And then once that's been done, I want you to roll those concepts out to the other areas of the critical national infrastructure. That is my strategy. Um, I think it should be the NCSC strategy. I'm starting to see that evolution come through. Uh, but, but that's what I think we should be doing. And then we should be creating domestic CNI groups outside of what's happening within the NCSC at the moment. Um, and we should be doing that outside of the normal inf information exchanges. And, and we've made specifications and we've started to pull those people together into, into consolidated groups. The other thing that allows you to do is to then start to exercise your continuity plans against real life scenarios. So what I'm saying there is Part of the reason why we started to do this for the Bank of England was they had a resilience group. And, and what we used to do, because uh, I used to do some of the consultancy for it a very long time ago, we used to identify the Isle of Dogs in London as, as being a critical area, there's lots of data centres there, and we used to cut off the power and say, what would happen to the financial services market if we did this? We used to pretend there was a bomb on the DLR, or we used to pretend the bridges were shut, all that sort of thing, and run simulations. Um, I insisted and tried really hard to get cyber into that as a concept. Um, I struggled for a number of years, and then we did something called Waking Shark, um, which came out with a number of vulnerabilities in terms of the cyber provision in some of these financial services. The difficulty with that was it was a single point exercise. And then what we needed to do from that was actually look at how we could extend that, which is where CBES came from, in terms of running that on a more frequent basis and looking at the individual services that support those critical national infrastructures. So that ability to look at that and then start to run a wider exercise. So in other words, you do your CBES activity, but then you see what your escalation process is going to be, is a really strong thing. Because all of a sudden, this isn't just built on, we pretended to blow things up. This is built on, we have an, ad, an external come in, they've got this far, how would you deal with it? That also is relevant to some of the smaller organisations as well. Because what I'm seeing at the moment is organisations saying, we've been ransomware attacked, we should pay. Because it's cheaper to actually pay than it is to try and recover the data, and they'll unlock it for us and we'll sort of fill in all the holes, and, that, and that's good. My question at that, in terms of a scenario, is, do you know where the money's going? Well, the answer to that is probably no, obviously, because you can't trace it. So that means you could be financing organised crime or terrorism. So that's illegal. 
My, how are you going to put that through your books? Embezzlement or something? Or you know, is there a category bucket that you could put it into? Is it? Is it? Uh, there's, there's all sorts of really bad terms I could use. Not one of which I think I could put on my books. Then you've got. And by the way, I'm going to have to open a Bitcoin account to be able to pay it. Right? I, I can assure you, my financial controllers, when I used to be on the board of Siemens, would not have been over keen on me opening a Bitcoin account to pay ransomware to a terrorist organisation. <laughs> so you can see that sometimes these decisions aren't made in a very logical way. And therefore, what we need to do is to exercise these things based on proper intelligence and based on good analytics and real life scenarios that we can actually stand behind. We then move into detection, really important. Uh, I've, I've done a huge amount of work trying to get the detection improved. Um, and I think what we can do from an artificial intelligence perspective is to look at this continual threat monitoring. So I'll come on to socks and things at the moment, but, but this is a concept that I think is real. Because at that point, you can say, what are people currently saying about me? What is the threat to my organisation or my sector? And what types of attack uh, vectors are we seeing um, prevalent within the marketplace? If we do that, then all of a sudden we can start to do some really clever things um, and tie into some of our other processes. So we then look at our SOC, our secure operating centres. We can then step up what we're doing in terms of monitoring. We can make sure we fully understand what's happening from that accreditation perspective and the information that's coming in. We tie the information that's actually happening on our networks and services and pull them, pull, pull them together. Um, but that concept of invocation before attack is the first time ever that I've actually seen that as a concept. So therefore, at that point, you can heighten awareness, you can do configuration reviews, you can update or you can do a penetration test to actually guarantee that you've actually got appropriate levels of protection in place. And finally, the recovery side, I would look to the schemes, those ones operated by the UK government or externally, those ones operated by the US, to actually look at how you accredit those types of organisations. But to look at that, again, it's difficult to provide that support at the lower level, so therefore we've got to use AI in terms of the certs, and we've got to try and provide artificial intelligence services to help that lower level market. And then if we can build artificial intelligence into our information exchanges, we've got CISP and things like that, which is a mass of information currently. It's almost unusable because the amount of people that are reporting. We need some analytical tools to actually help us to draw out the inference that isn't currently there. These are the qualifications that we cover, and this is the areas that we're moving into, into this non-licensed fellowship area. But the concept behind the skill shortage, I, I think, is worth another two minutes of people's time. Um, we need to upskill our existing workforce. We need to encourage more talented people into our industry. And what we're seeing in other professions is this big impact in terms of AI and big data analytics in accountancy, audit, um, all sorts of other areas of the professions where we believe we're going to be replaced by automation or at least augmented by automation. And we should be doing much more of the same. So how does the market react to upskilling the existing workforce? Again. We can do that either by the use of technology, which I think again is AI and big data analytics. So we've got to do that because we've got to augment the skills and the availability of, of a scarce resource. And then how does the market react to difficulties in recruiting talent? If they're not available on the marketplace, they automate. And certainly that's what I'm seeing, or they dis disrupt, and that's what I'm seeing within the bug bounty. So the use of advanced vulnerability assessment tools and then the move towards bug bounty gives you an indication of people trying to circumvent the problems they've got in terms of availability of skilled resource. And therefore, what we're trying to do is to operate this as more like a profession, and this work we're doing looking at the charter status is really important to us. And the changes that have happened in that particular area is we've stopped driving a little bus over a, a horse and cart over a bridge, and if something falls in the water, you might be unlucky and be killed because your horse has fallen on top of you, to building the fourth bridge, where if it fails, we're losing an awful lot of lives and we're losing an awful lot of infrastructure and money. And I think that's been the big change in terms of that. And we're seeing, seeing things like Section 166s used by the financial services uh, to actually drive that into the marketplace to have skilled people providing services in these areas. So in summary, reduction of threat and the use of artificial intelligence is looking at that analytical side of gathering the threat information and being able to do something about it. And then we collaboratively should be doing more to help on the interventions to stop young people being groomed into cybercrime in the, in the same way as we've done that for gangs and we've done that for sexual activities. 
the reduction of vulnerabilities, we should be looking at the use of artificial intelligence and big data analytics for their vulnerability analysis tools and a greater use of smarter tools. And we need to use that to augment the expertise of the individuals that are available. On our detection, we need to really up our game in terms of our SOC and link it into our escalation and incident response processes. But at the same time, I think we should be looking at continual threat monitoring and use of artificial intelligence in that domain would really help. And then in terms of recovery, I think we need to automate some of the malware reverse engineering. We need to automate some of the incident response activities and the intrusion analysis work. And we need to build that into things and we need to upskill our existing business continuity planning people who generally still write documents and plans about how to move from one physical location to the other. If we do that, then we could have a balanced security program, which I think is a much more appropriate place to go.